Good, good. My name is Michael Dickens. Um, I am the chair of the Visiting Artist Speaker Series. The SECA Visiting Artist Speaker Series has been a while. It's been about a year and a half since I've actually had to do this in front of people. Um, thanks for coming out and thanks to everyone that is uh, joining us via Zoom and Facebook Live. Um, yeah, so this is made possible by the Center of Excellence for the Creative Arts. Um, Awesome P has the only Center of Excellence for the Creative Arts devoted to the Creative Arts, right? So we have uh, the Center, which is SECA, uh, sponsors art design, music, theater, dance, and creative writing. And we use that funding to bring in artists directly to you guys for lectures, workshops, um, exhibitions, and all that other good stuff. Um, for those of you who are here, if you're a community member and don't have a little peeling way to sign in, there's a sign in sheet up front. Please let us know who you are just so we can count numbers. Um, for those of you that came in early and got a little bitty ticket, right? When you came in, afterwards, when the lecture is over, you can come see me and I can give you this gorgeous limited edition letterpress poster uh, made by our very own Patrick Vincent. So thank you, Patrick. Um, um, of course, everyone, I see everyone has masks on. That's awesome. And you're also wearing them over your nose as well, which is great, right? We're learning. Um, so uh, this live streaming and this event, again, is made possible by Sika. And I just want to give a, a special shout out to Dr. Janice Cruz, who's behind the uh, controls, making all of this happen. She's the director of the Center of Excellence for the Creative Arts, so give her a hand. All right, so James and Melissa Buchanan are the little friends of printmaking, a duo of printmakers, illustrators, designers with BFAs in printmaking from the University of Wisconsin. They were ADC Young Guns honoree and have won honors uh, awards from the uh, from American Illustration, Print Magazine, and Communication. Uh, their clients include Disney, FX, Cartoon Network, and Nike. Their work has been published in books such as New Masters of Poster, Des Poster Design, among others. And their first children's book, Studio, A Place for Art to Start, was released in March 2020 through Tundra, Tundra Books. Uh, in addition to their work as illustrators and designers, they continue their fine art pursuits through exhibitions, lectures, and artist residencies worldwide, spreading the gospel of silkscreen to anyone inclined to listen. Um, the little friends current live in Los Angeles with way too many animals and so it is my pleasure my honor to welcome them to Austin P. Please give them a, a round of applause. I'm going to sneak past so I can see the screen. Otherwise I, I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, hi there we're the little friends of printmaking from Pasadena California. We're a husband and wife team of artists and designers that specialize in silkscreen prints and posters. We were already longtime collaborators when we were hired to design our first poster 18 years, six months, and 17 days ago. Uh, and we've given some version of this presentation 49 times previously, so hopefully this goes all right. So uh, let's look at pictures and talk about them. Uh, who we are, uh, this is us, uh, give or take 50 pounds. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, here, go to the next one. So, uh, I don't know, Alyssa and I, are, we're like a, a collaborative duo, and we met uh, uh, in college. We both went to the University of Wisconsin. We met in a, a fundamentals course, and our artwork looked so similar that we were like, okay, well, either this is my enemy, or this is my best friend, and so, and my collaborator, and like, luckily, we chose the latter, and everything worked out all right. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we went to the University of Wisconsin, which was like number one in the country for printmaking at the time, and maybe it still is, who knows? I don't read new U.S. News and World Reports, uh, but anyway, like, so we went there, and, and you know, I was studying sculpture, and I was in a dusty room with like one light bulb hanging down, and Melissa was in her gleaming palace of printmaking, these gorgeous studios that were like as big as a football field, and I just got a little jealous, and I was like, you know, what am I doing? I'm wasting my life. And she thought so too. So, you know, then we started making prints together. And it's just really great because printmaking sort of suggests having a buddy. 
And so we just made all our friends together from then on. And we just, we started working together and then we just kind of never stopped. That's accurate. Do you have anything to say? <laughs> I think you covered it, that's great. <laughs> well, uh, let's move on because I've run out of things to say. Uh, this is what our work looks like. This is an old example, but I feel like it's, it's pretty good. This is a, a poster for an art exhibition uh, at a graphic design conference, a, a poster exhibition, like a poster design exhibition. And so like, oh, no, go back to it, because I have. And so like our idea for a poster for a, a you know, a poster art show is, is to show, like, make it extremely about posters. So like you see that it's got like the, uh, the little registration marks in the corners, and you can see that the poster is the guy working on the poster, and it's not done yet. And like, you know, if you go to the next slide, you can see, or, oh, is it cut out? I don't know what it is. Anyway, like the, at the top where you see the file name, it says, you know, final, 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 really final this time, in version 13 in the .ai. Yeah, I think it was done at like, you know, three in the morning the day of the show. Right, right. So like, we we're just trying to encapsulate the experience of being a designer in the poster. But also like this is emblematic of our work because, you know, we work primarily, almost exclusively, in silkscreen. And so like we love to have, you know, color layers that go over each other and make different colors and textures. You know, I don't know. We're just in love with the medium and completely inspired by it. So like that's we just want this to be like and all of our work to be extremely silk screen. Yeah, including the uh, smudge marks that we made. Oh <laughs> um, yeah, our, our thumbprints. So it's like a press sheet that's gone very, very wrong. <laughs> yeah, there's our thumbprints. And so you see that the guy is like uh, still designing it and he's got his like menu coming down and it's just like literally every poster uh, cliche that we could think of, you know, ironic Swiss grid, ironic Helvetica, you know, that sort of stuff. And insert, insert cliche vernacular, hide shortcomings, demystify process, deconstruct, wink, like these are all our tricks and like, you know, we'll just... Yeah. You will definitely see a ladder for no reason. Oh yeah, and animal head on human body. Pieces. Oh yeah, <laughs> we're we're critiquing ourselves. We're not going after everybody else. I mean, maybe a little bit, but yeah. You know. <laughs> well, we're all in this together, okay, guys? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, silk screen, it's good. Uh, <laughs> is silk screen easy? No, it's not easy. And silk screen gets a terrible reputation. I remember we were students like you once, and we were at an art lecture where Jim Dine was talking about, you know, lithos that he was doing at the time. And then, for seemingly out of nowhere, he just started talking about how much he hated silkscreen. And at that point, Melissa and I were so deep into silkscreen. It was our baby. We loved it. And to hear, like, a famous artist be like, the colors are so thin, they're always transparent. Like, you can see one layer going over the next layer. Like yeah, they just sit there on top of the paper like they're supposed to do something else. I don't know. <laughs> I guess they're supposed to blend together, but yes, like being shiny and plasticky and cheap and accessible and the colors being too bright, these are the things that made us fall in love with silkscreen. These were the things that we were trying to like bring out of silkscreen and, you know, he hated it so much and our ears were just burning and like, you know, it's a good thing that it wasn't like later in life when we were more strident and like feeling better about ourselves because we would have just rushed the stage and like waved a banner that said, silkscreen is good. <laughs> Right. Or at least written a, a very strongly worded email. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Substreet has a terrible reputation because people feel like it's easy. They think that Riso is hard and Substreet is easy. And Riso is a copy machine. Come on, guys, let's get real. Oh, no. Please don't come for us, Riso people. We love Riso too. Yeah. Just not as much as Substreet. Right. <laughs> but anyway, let's, let's move on. Here's a video demonstration. If, if you're unfamiliar, I think. Yeah.
kind of BS that we do all day long. <laughs> all happy dance. So yeah, like you can see, like just layers go on top of each other. And sure, if you're gym down, it's all very day class A. But we love it, and we love to like <laughs> hide little details in, and like we just love all the technical aspects of it. And I mean, there's nothing about subscription that we don't love, except for the back aches and like you know. Yeah. Being up too late and stuff like that. But I mean, pretty much any limitation that screen print has thrown at us, we have turned into a positive, you right. know, and, and it's become part of our aesthetics. So. Right. So anyway, you probably can't see this if you're if you're looking at this on Zoom, you're having no trouble with this at all. Can you guys see the cat? Mm -hmm. A little bit. Okay, okay, a little bit. All right. So this is a, a, one of our favorite prints of ours, and it's called Midnight Cat, and it's black ink on black paper. And this is one of those things that it just it cannot exist as a JPEG because if you're case in point, case in point <laughs> if you're in this room, if your monitor isn't calibrated correctly, then this is just a, a black rectangle that has like two eyes sticking out of it. And it seems like little friends have gotten really conceptual. Or, or, or extremely lazy or <laughs> yeah. have to do something. We didn't print your poster for you. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is just one of those things where we're like, let's just do black ink on black paper and see what it looks like. And, and honestly, it came from a mistake. Like, you know, you're, as part of the printing process, sometimes you have to print off. You grab a piece of scratch paper and then you print an image onto some scratch paper just to get the ink in the screen the way you want it. And we printed a black image on black paper and we were like, ah, you can see that. Can we do something with this? And so we ended up doing like, you know, a black cat hiding in the dark and on a black paper. And it was one of those things where, you know, uh, because JPEGs are important, you know, we put this up for sale on our site and didn't sell any because, you know, it's a black rectangle with two green eyes sticking out of it. And then as soon as we took it in front of people, like we were selling it in person, it's all we could sell. Like people just took them and took them and took them from us. Because, like, it's really interesting. Like, you know, it's prints are, or screen prints especially, but all prints are like more like a 3D object than an image. They're like a combination of, you know, layers going over each other and the texture of the paper and the texture of the ink. And you just don't get that with, I mean, illustration and graphic design, even though we love them, you know. So we're, we're addicted to it. Yeah, we do like to approach the, the screen print as sort of like almost a sculptural medium. The first time we did, you know, accidentally print black ink on black paper, of course, our art minds were like, wouldn't it be funny if we did like 20 layers of black? Yes. And we start like building up these black layers into like something truly sculptural and then you know you have to kind of like rear back a little bit and be like well that's not really acceptable so <laughs> yeah that's truly crazy yeah but yeah uh and then it sort of became doing prints with hidden cats on them just became sort of like an informal series and it, everything just sort of became about like the printing process and like what the different ways we could express the same idea through silkscreen. Like, there's a white cat cut out of a yellow thing, and then it's you know covered up with transparent leaves and stuff. Or you know, the cat is entirely underneath a black, big black printed rectangle of sparkly ink or something like that. So I don't know. We just yeah, print our prints are about something. They're about a cat usually, but like then they're also about silkscreen and they're about the process and. That kind of stuff. Yeah, truly, I think all three of these prints, some of the students saw the yellow square print in class, and to see the JPEG and see the print, it's a, it's a different experience, you right. know, because you're not really seeing the metallics that are in the You're not really seeing the transparency. Or how shiny. Or how shiny it is, or yeah. how, yeah, the, the light is reflected back to you on the surface of the ink. So, yeah. you know, as much as we love being um, illustrators and designers, ultimately, you know, printmaking is where our heart lies. Yeah, because it's, it's like magic. It's, it, I mean, truly, you, you watched her print in that video. It's like a magic trick. And like, I'm the magician, but I'm also like the slack jaw yokel who's like, whoa. <laughs> so like, every time I'm excited. Uh, and then this is from a show we did where everything was printed onto like a metallic gold foil. So like, we try to stay really plugged into the material. I mean, that's the thing with the black on black print, is that's just us trying to be extremely plugged into the materials and what they can do and like make the most out of them. And so we found some uh, gold metallic foil and we were like, well, what can we do with this? Yeah, and it's interesting because a lot of uh, poster makers were using metallic foils 
And they were using them as sort of variants, so they would do their editions and then they would have some special prints that were that cost more than the normal prints, but they were on metallic foil. But it was very interesting, but they didn't really react to the idea that their print was on metallic. It was just sort of like, this is a feature, you know? But we where, wanted where to kind of- Where white? Now it's gold. Wow. Yeah, but we wanted to sort of, I mean, first of all, the paper is expensive and we wanted to show it off. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but secondly, you know, we really, wanted to react and sort of like add to the experience of viewing these prints in person. Right. So we kind of tried to um, have the concepts of the illustrations be about viewing these prints in person. Right. So like all the artwork in the show ended up being about looking and looking at somebody. Because ultimately, I mean, what's sad about both of these, or all three of these photos that we've taken is Usually when someone is trying to take a picture of these prints, they're in them. But that's like on purpose. It's like you're in the print and the person in the print is looking at you. And like, I don't know. I, that, that's us being too art, frankly, for my Well, taste. But you know, I mean, it's interesting because you know, we do a lot of illustration work and we do a lot of art prints. But one of the things that really the only time we allow ourselves to experiment are when we are are doing making a large body of work for an art show like this mm -hmm. you know we wouldn't normally do an art print on gold foil just not tested because it's not an easy thing to work with it's right. you know it's not the devil you know you know right. so I had to do a lot of experimentation to figure out an ink that would stick to this without scratching off and be, you know basically being like a gigantic lottery ticket um, so we ended up uh, using a air cure ink that uh, they use for stickers and skateboards. Yeah, they use for skateboards. So it was. It's like a, yeah, it's like vinyl. I mean, I mean, all ink is vinyl, but this is like, boy, this is vinyl. Yeah. So it was a way. You know, now it's something that I have in my arsenal that I know how to use that I wouldn't normally, nor would not normally have known how to do. Right. Uh, and this is a print that some of you saw if you were uh, at the workshop today. This is from our most recent show, which is called Silkscreen, it is easy. And it was a show uh, largely of monoprints, where we're combining uh, the Silkscreen method uh, with monoprint. So each print has like an element of randomness in it where we're, you know, daubing ink onto the screen and, and swirling it around and marbleizing it. And so, I mean, I don't really have much to say about this. This is a fruit bowl. Yes, it is a fruit bowl. I'm very literal. <laughs> But like, here's another example of that. You can see in the hair, like how the the marbling in the hair, and then like I don't know. Sometimes we just like to have fun. <laughs> Sometimes we just get like to get loose a little bit. But so I mean, you've heard us rave about soap screen, and we just feel like it's just the most important part of our process. It's the most important part of our practice. I, I we mostly. If we wanted to, we could just be illustrators at this point. But making silkscreen is just so central to what we do because, like, I, we really get a charge out of being able to make something really good, really fast, really cheap. Because just the economics and the speed of the thing is just—it's to die for. Like, we just came from Chicago where we did the Renegade Craft Fair, and we sold prints for extremely cheap all weekend long to just an endless stream of people, including like little children who get out their little coin purse and give us crumpled dollar bills and like to old ladies and like because we were able to sell prints for cheap, we just, it changed our whole life. Yeah, I mean, when we were in art school, is it okay to talk about this? I don't know what you're going to talk about. So okay. I'm, I'm just going to say yes, and then I'll, I'll wave wildly if I change my mind. When we were in art school, it, you know, we started off making, you know, editions of six. Sure. And trying to sell them for as much as a student can sell work for, like $150 or something like that. $200. Yeah. And it, frankly, did not make me happy at all. I, did, I really rankled at the experience of curating my audience through how much money they made a year. Like, right. I didn't like the idea that if you didn't have a certain amount of extra money that you wanted to spend on art, you couldn't enjoy my art in person, you right. know? And so we kind of had to rethink our process, and, you know, we one of the things that we love about print is the democracy of it. The idea that, like, you can make a lot of things for relatively little money, 
and how much do you really need to charge, you right. know? So we usually charge between $20 and $30 for an 18 by 24 print. And I know that that seems crazy to a lot of people, but at the same time, I just really enjoy that, like James said, a, a child can come and spend their allowance on buying a print. Like, people have sent us pictures of, you know, their niece's room, and it's like a Justin Bieber poster and then one of our posters. And I love that. Like, I cannot get enough of that, because who am I to say that you can't own my work? Right. You know, that doesn't make any sense to me. No, you can't talk about any of that. I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Delete it. Uh, run it back. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no. I'm just. Yeah. Anyway, we love silk screen. So yeah. It wasn't clear. That's <laughs> why silk screen. There you go. Uh, oh, yeah. And we, we just put out, or we didn't put it out. Uh, a publisher put out a monograph of our stuff. And it was so funny because, like, originally they wanted very professional, straight over the top, very highly lit photos of our prints and we were just like no wrong and we like just took photos with an iPhone and that's what ended up being in the book because the detail photos are the only way that you can capture the experience of like holding a print and up to the light and like moving it around in the light and getting all the different sort of effects so the book ended up being more like this where it's just almost like a collage of things from our prints but like shot in a way where you can see like the light coming off of the, you know, I don't know, the print. I'm just going to say the word print over again. Now. <laughs> yeah, well, you can see that, that you saw the, the yellow cat one before and like, you know, now you can see how, you know, different it can look in different lights. Like you, the, the picture you saw before is accurate and so is this. And that is like the magic of silk screen is that like things can change really dramatically. Yeah, depending even on, depending on like, you know, moving a print from one corner of the room to the other. Right, or the time of day. Mm -hmm. uh, how silkscreen has helped us as illustration designers. This is the why of silkscreen, ultimately. Uh, doing something with clear limitations can, gives you a set of rules to work within. Uh, that's really important to us, because truly, if especially nowadays, like, you open up, uh, a, you know, your Adobe suite, and, like, all tools of all sorts of different disciplines are just open to you and it's like, make something. That's terrible. That's just too much for my little pea brain to handle. But like, so screen is something that has like these defined rules and boundaries and we work within them. All those things that Jim Dyden was complaining about, those are like the walls of the box and the box is like the little room where Melissa and I work. And that's where we're comfortable doing our thing. And it helped us it helped us develop taste, it helped us develop a visual style, it helped us develop mastery of like a very set thing. And I don't know, it just, it just helped us grow. Uh, Silk screen is hard, but the mistakes we make turn into ideas for new designs. This is 100% the case of a lot of the things that we showed you already. Like, you make a mistake, something's off register, or you're looking at a print off and you're just like, that's a print. That's a print. Someone just has to like come up with the what and the why. Because here's like an amazing process thing that I never would have come up with in a million years, except by making a mistake. Uh, making something tangible forces you to be more thoughtful about what you're designing. I mean, this we think about this all the time. That we are, and uh, we don't want to endlessly put product out in the world that doesn't need to exist. Right. You know? We call it future garbage. Yeah. We call all of our work future garbage. To be honest with you. Um, because let's be real, you know. It's all what future. Isn't? I mean, it's all future garbage. Every, I mean, I, all, other than people, everything in, in this room is future garbage. Yeah, and maybe even me. I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> um, just put me in a ditch when I'm done. But uh, like, you know, it's just one of those things that it's like we've we've actually stopped designing prints halfway through because we say to ourselves, this, this doesn't even this doesn't even need to exist. Yeah. You know. Um, so we really, you know, this is something that's going to take up room in our flat file, room in our house. Is it something that needs to be in the world? Do people want this? Does it, does it fill a niche? Will people respond to it? Right. And like when you're doing an art show, you, you, of course you're experimenting. But like, like I was saying, you know, we flew to Chicago with a case with 100 pounds of print in it. Do I have room for the print that I think nobody wants? Or should I just like, that can be an illustration. Or that could be a failed attempt, and we'll just come back to it later. Or it could just be a sketch. Or it could just be a sketch. Yeah. 
Uh, it doesn't have to be so screen. It can be some other discipline, but like, you know. Yeah, or you can, it can be silk screen, and then you take what you learned into another discipline, like, say, illustration. And let's move on. Like, this is a, a spread from uh, the kid's book that Mike was talking about, a studio, uh, where a baby bunny is going through the uh, art studio building and seeing all different kinds of studios. But anyway, like, the reason why I'm showing this is this is not a silk screen, like, but we bring that ethos with us wherever we go. Like, yeah, we still are using the same limited color palette that we would use, that is our favorite color palette to use, um, that you've probably seen in the talk previously. Um, and it was just really, it was a rewarding project to work on because you know we got to basically show people the idea of uh, art, studio art as a job. Yeah. You know? So each spread kind of showed uh, different studios, furniture studios, printmaking studios, ceramic studios, and presented these as this is a place where people work. Right. This is how some people make their living. It's a sort of an antidote to the, all the STEM books that have been coming out for the past 15 years that are like, forget about art. Here's a Erlenmeyer flask and a pipette. Have fun, kids. You're going to have. Because, <laughs> so, like, you know, we're artists. This is a job. Like, uh, we've been making our living at this for 20 years. So, yeah. Like, well, and I think that it's important to remember, I mean, as much as we appreciate STEM, that like, you know, uh, learning the arts develops a certain part of your brain that other things don't necessarily, and they don't have to they exist individually, you know. You yeah, know, they don't have to be in opposition to each other all the time. We don't have to erase art to put in STEM. So that's what we did in this children's book, we forced all those, <laughs> forced all those ideas into it. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a poster from, well, I guess we did the collateral for uh, Southwest, Southwest uh, Interactive a few years ago. And this is a, was a big poster, like, I guess it was four feet high or whatever, yeah. and they put it all over Austin. And it's so funny to me, I mean, to go back to what we were saying about bringing the silkscreen aesthetic into illustration, because to us, this is like an unlimited palette. And when they got this, they were like, oh, we love how you brought the silk screen look to this. I mean, this limited palette. And I'm like, there are hundreds of colors in this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you we went wild here. What are you talking about? But I guess it's just, I don't know what it is. Like, uh, it, it's something intangible that, like, comes from silk screen is carried over. Maybe it's the way the shapes are drawn. I don't know. You know what? Never mind. <laughs> All I can say is never mind. But this is not a silk screen either. Uh, getting yourself out there. We get asked a lot about this a lot, so we always try to like just sort of put our story uh, into a few slides. Um, the main way that we get ourselves out there is through self-initiated work. But like we started out uh, doing posters. Like yeah. we, we were in we college. We started in college, and you know we were lucky to be living in a town like Madison that has such a rich print history mm -hmm. that you know venues wanted posters for shows and it really does make a difference you know if you've got like a tiny show at some like a punk co vegan co-op in the basement of a church that was our main employer that was our main employer, employer a punk vegan co-op in the basement of a church which is it, not it truly is a hard sell like yeah. it's like oh smog or lace after fat or smog is playing just go down this dark stairwell in the bottom of a church. We promise. I promise this is not a cult indoctrination. <laughs> yeah, you'll leave with all your organs. Uh, so it was important for there to be posters. And like, you know, the promoter went to a show of ours that had a bunch of silkscreen work that looked vaguely postery. And they, he was like, would you do this? I see you at the shows all the time. You could get it for free and sell the posters. And we were like, yeah, sure. And we just tried it out. And we were like, this is great. Because like we got into the show for free, and we met the band, like we sold a bunch of posters, and mm -hmm. then and then it becomes a thing of like, oh, we were selling prints, we were trying to sell one or two prints for two hundred dollars a piece. We just sold like a hundred posters at ten dollars a piece. This is the business that we want to be in. And then it, you know you're a local band poster artist, and then you're a national poster artist if things go well, and then like. Then you get sick of making posters, and then you move on to the rest of your life. Uh, that's and then you become James and Melissa. Right. Um, but on the left is something we did recently. Like, we don't we completely give up making posters. Honestly, everything that we make is a poster. If it's 18 by 24, it's a silk screen. I feel like it's a poster. Yeah. But that's a poster for a tour for, for Patton. And then, like, the one on the, the right is um, the exhibition.
Vision poster for the Nirvana retrospective thing at uh, the Experience Music Project in Seattle. But it's funny because, like, you know, we made it and it, I had already gone to press, and then we got a very panicked phone call from the museum, and they were like, Courtney Love has told us that she can, we can't put the word Nirvana on anything that is for sale at the museum, or she will sue. Mm -hmm. And so we were like, they were like, tell me that this has not gone to press. And we were like, oh, it went to press. But I have an idea. And it's a big blue rectangle <laughs> under which you can see the word Nirvana. But for all legal intents and purposes, it is a poster for an unnamed band's retrospective exhibition at a museum. Anyway, so I, oh yeah, I, I should say, go back to that. I, I, that's why I like this, because it's like a little clue at the bottom. Huge business cards. That's what posters are like. Uh, Art Chantry said that to us when we were starting out. And boy, is it true. Like, you put a poster out into the world, like it gets hung up around town, and then you get an email. Because someone is like, I saw your poster. Can you make me a poster? And then it's just like, it's this thing that just goes on and on and on. And yeah. Like, and we used to teach, um, uh, like we used to run a print publishing lab at an educational museum. And one of the classes that we taught was poster making, and we would tie it to, you know, an actual event like we, Yola Tango was playing, and so we had the students make posters for Yola Tango, obviously we got the okay from Yola Tango. And we made sure, you know, we forced them, because some people are really They're shy scared. about it, they don't want to put, you know, their website on the back of something, they their don't want to... Their email or their name. Yeah, and we were just like, no, you have to do this, because if people find this and they like it, they will want to find you. You know, yeah. it's like, don't make it hard we, for people. We made them hang up their posters in the street. And we made them put the, a packet of posters together and send it to Yotengo's management. We made them do all these things because these are the things that we did that made a difference in our lives. So yeah. like, you know, I don't know. Sometimes you're a teacher and it's like, do the thing. <laughs> uh, these are the, eventually we did get sick of posters because we would work really hard on a poster, and then people would be like, I love it, I hate that band. Or they'd say, I, I bought your print, and then I cut, I'm so glad you put the band name at the bottom, because I just cut it off with a pair of scissors. Or they'd like frame out all the, like, the text, like, because they wanted the illustration, and they didn't want the band. Well, we also had difficulty, you know, when we were studying at Madison, um, it's one of the first schools in the nation to consider printmaking a fine art form. And as, so they, as opposed to a commercial medium. As opposed to a commercial medium. And so they really did not enjoy the idea that we thought it was funny to play with the boundary between commercial and fine art. And so, you know, a lot of the times that we had to hand in a project, we would hand in a gig poster because that's what we we're doing. And, you know, it's, it did the boundaries of the assignment for a silk screen or etching or whatever. And they would be like, we don't want to read the work. We're not even going to consider that part of the design. You know, we don't love that it's like a commercial thing. So we were so just like, really hard on these words. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, oh no, can you not read? That's super sad. Um, <laughs> but it's like, okay, well, if we remove all evidence of type, if we just make it about the art, but we still use the and, same aesthetic, and we it's, still not, use, it's not for an event. Yeah, it's, it's not, not for an event. It's not for anything. It exists because of its own volition. Um, but it's like the same aesthetic, the same size, the same number of colors, the same edition size, and we're selling it for really cheap. Then will you like what we're doing? And so these were the first two that we made. One is called Fight Diagram, and the other one is called Filth Party. Filth Party is perfect for grandma or baby. Yeah. Uh, it's perfect for the nursery. Yeah. <laughs> but so, I mean, you can. But you know, we, were different, we were different people in 2004 or we so. We were angry students, please forgive us. You know? <laughs> but so we were just like, okay, here. Here's our work without the trappings of it being commercial. Do you like it? And they said no. <laughs> they were lying. Yeah, they still did not enjoy it. Which I mean, you know, looking at it to be fair, I I, I know we were angry students and we were a handful. I'm sure we yeah. were probably the nightmare students in our school. But <laughs> but anyway, we made these and we had such a good time making them because obviously we didn't have to worry. And you can tell from how crazy we went that we didn't have to worry about like what you know a client or a band might think. We were just having fun with the medium of poster art and just doing it for ourselves like it was art. And then, you know, we had such a great time and then we put them on for sale and they were the fastest things we ever sold. And we were like, see you later, poster art. Goodbye, concert posters. And we just 
started making things and selling them in person. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that we make. This is a boat. You can obviously see from the previous slide to this slide what a clear trajectory we've had in our <laughs> aesthetic. I know. We have completely lost whatever scary edge that we had at age 24. <laughs> but uh, anyway, this is the kind of thing that we make. And like, you know, it's kind of funny because uh, self-initiated work ends up being really important to us because, you know, if you don't make self-initiated work like this, and this isn't for anybody, this is just something we made and we sold. Uh, if you don't make self-initiated work, then you end up just making the same thing over and over again that an art director tells you to make as an illustrator. Because all they can do is ask you to do the thing that they saw. And that's reasonable, but it's really boring. So, you know, we make something like this, and again, just like the business card thing, this becomes a business card where it's like, I make a boat, please hire me to make the boat. I make a boat for you, I make a boat for them, please. <laughs> I can do this. This is the thing I can do. But you know, if we hadn't actually made this and it existed in the world, it would be hard to explain this like specific aesthetic of what we're trying to achieve. Oh my God! Like, imagine that. We don't want to have any like heavy key layer, and we don't want to have any blacks, and it's just all it's about just, like colors interacting with each other, and like it's like know. a boat, and it's kind of like Jim Flora, but it's not. And then like this happens. Like imagine happens. if we just had to explain it to you, you would think we're insane. So yeah, I, we're on the phone with the art director being like, can I make like a weird boat? Yeah. So it was important for us to have to make it so that we could just advance our aesthetic. Right. Yes, because you can't experiment on the client's style. Absolutely not. This is, this is rule number one. So uh, they just don't let you do it. So, oh well, I mean, you got to do it yourself. And so that's why it's really important for everybody to make self-directed work, even if you're, you know, you aspire to be an illustrator. So yeah, I mean, and so that's what we do. This is essentially our story over and over again of the last 10 or 15 years of our career, which is we make a print, and our director sees it, and is like, that's a good print. That would be good in a book, or a print ad, or this would be good, I don't know, somewhere else. I'm not an art director. I don't do these things. <laughs> they just tell us what to draw, and usually it's something that we've already drawn. So we get a, kind of get to invent our own job, where we made the thing on the left, uh, a print that was like a, a bunny working at a table, and then that becomes an ad for international paper, where they're like, can you have a different working bunny? We like that bunny. Give us a different bunny. <laughs> and so now we're the people who draw bunnies. Sometimes. Sometimes. And again, like they're, they're just like, do it again. Like we made this series of prints uh, like that are of storefronts, and then Hewlett Packard was like, can you make us a storefront that says support local or neighborhood businesses? And we're like, yeah, sure, what the heck? I mean, how much money are you going to pay us? <laughs> that's pretty much our, that's our job, like, is to just, like, do, and we're lucky in a way because we like drawing the storefront. It would be a real bummer if we didn't. And then they were like, do it again, do it again. So, you know, I don't know. I mean, that's, uh, it is important, you know, and we've told students this time again, like, it's important to do the thing that you really enjoy doing because you will probably get asked to do it over and over and over. Well, and the other thing about it is it will show, it will show how much you like it. We love things like this, the storybook aesthetic and like the architecture, we love sign art, we love all this stuff that's in both of these pieces. Yeah. And like, we love lettering and like doing all that kind of stuff. And I feel like it shows that we like all that stuff. And if yeah. it didn't, it would look really faux and bad. Yeah, I feel like you would be able to sense that our enthusiasm was not in the project. Right. And then, you know, sometimes you're doing work for clients and they are like, do it this way, and then you do it that way, and they're like, I hate it. The, the job is killed, it's over. And you get the kill fee, which is... It's truly amazing to be paid to go away. <laughs> it makes Melissa very uncomfortable, but it makes me so happy. <laughs> Because, like, I don't have to finish. Oh, my God. I, I'm such a cheapskate, but, like, the one on the right was for spam. And originally, it was these people all wearing sunglasses. It was supposed to be about, you know, eating spam in Los Angeles. And they were all eating spam burgers or spam masubi or whatever, all the different people. They are all enjoying themselves and smiling. And then they killed the project. They were like, ugh, this is terrible. And, but at that, and they paid us the kill fee. They also had already paid us to print the posters, and they gave us all the paper and the ink, 
but we didn't have to get any of it back. So we had all the money, and we didn't have to do anything. And then we turned around and we just erased all the things with, that said spam, and we sold the print. So it's like, I was just like, I'm amazed. It's like, illustration is a racket, but like sometimes you are on the right side of things. Yeah, very rarely. Very rarely, but like sometimes. And it's the same with the other one, where the client was like, can you draw me a cat riding in a car down the coast, of, like the coast of France or whatever? And the cat's the front of the of the, the car, the cat's car is also a cat. And I was like, boy, do I not want to do that? And so we like designed a different thing, like an alternate thing, which she ended up accepting and being like, what was I thinking with this cat car thing? And then like when I'm like, what am I going to do with this? And I'm like, I don't actually think it's that bad. And again, like we just sold it, and we still sell it. And well, we're actually working on a project right now where they specifically reference this as the. It's not even our idea. I mean, whatever. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, making self-initiated work, it lets us push our aesthetic forward when the market just wants us to do the same thing over and over again. It gives us room to experiment. I mean, it really does. Uh, and then, I, mean, I don't know anything else to say about that. Uh, it means we're not just waiting around for some art director to tell us what to do. And this is really important, you know, especially, obviously, COVID time was really weird. It continues to be weird, continues to be happening. Um, and we also were working artists in the 2008 crash, too. And it was really important to us then that, you know, when all the jobs dried up, that we were just working on our own stuff. Mm -hmm. um, we're kind of like, We've invented this job for ourselves where we're almost too small to fail. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're too small to fail. Things are, the, what we make is too cheap to, you know, have a crash happen to it in value because it's already completely at the bottom. Yeah. So if you want to cheer yourself up and you've got $20, like it's pretty easy to just buy something from us and, you know, make <laughs> a little bit happier. Well, um, I also feel like the thing with, waiting around for an art director to tell you what to do. You might spend the rest of your life waiting for an art director to tell you what to do. Like, yeah. none of this is guaranteed. Like, I have definitely gone through periods where I'm like, I guess we're never illustrating a book again, or I guess we're never doing a magazine cover again. I'm in one of those holes right now. I haven't done a magazine cover in a year and a half, maybe. And like... But we are working on two books. We are working on two books. Look, we're very, very busy. <laughs> But like, you know, if you, if you don't have self-initiated work, if you don't have that part of your practice where like uh, you run it yourself and it's a secondary way to make income, you, you could just, you know, wither away and die in a closet somewhere, you know? I, yeah. I know it's a well, sad story. It is a very sad story. <laughs> um, but I think it's also, it's hard to transition out from school because, you know, school is all about somebody giving you the thing. Oh, right? absolutely. Hot and, and cold running critique. Hot and cold running critique, which is not something you're going to have when you graduate. You know, nobody's going to tell you, oh, this thing you made, like, pat you on the head, like, it's really good. You know what I mean? Like, or you're probably going to hear, like, nothing. Yeah. And so... The most polite thing you'll hear is nothing. Yeah. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. So it's important to sort of instill that drive in you that makes you want to create stuff regardless of, you know, somebody asking you or telling you to do it. Yeah. Uh, it gives us a measure of control over the direction of our career. I must be just talking about those. I'm so sorry. Oh, no. But we didn't rehearse. <laughs> no, it's not good. Shut it down. Uh, I'm just going to touch the dollar signs. Da -da 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 it's just it's just so important. Like, it's important for artists to understand that, like, waiting around for the world to, like, give you an amazing art career is probably not going to happen. Like, that's like a lightning strike kind of thing, and it probably is just for people who are already wealthy and in New York. So like, it's very important for the people in this room and the people watching on Zoom to like, come up with a, like a business model that can keep them going until apparently the time is right and people wake up and they see what you're doing and they really appreciate it. So whether that's being an artist who also does illustration, or whether it's being an illustrator that sells prints, or, you know, something like that. I, I, I'm talking about myself, but like that's the thing is maybe you make purses or like, I, I, I don't know. I, I can't imagine what it is. Yeah. That's for you to figure out. That's not my job. You're not my mom. <laughs> you had to figure out your mom's job. 
Um, but I, you know, yeah, it's it, it's important to have at least for us, you know, multiple revenue streams, um, so we can roll with weird times. But also just because you don't get too bored, you know what I mean? Like we enjoy going coming to do these kinds of things, um, and we enjoy going and selling work in person when we can because you know interacting with the customer face to face is so invaluable like you can see what's working and what's not again it's kind of like a critique setting in a way if yeah. you are ready to deal with just like you know the just public like fire hose of critique yeah the public area. just you know hearing out of the corner of your ear like I hate that. saying like that's so weird Ew, who wants that you know what I mean but it's just like again it's it's important stuff to know because you can see like what's working and what's not working. Right. Um, Absolutely. And so we do that, we do illustration work obviously, and we do gallery shows, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, all of that is important to us. I don't know what we could get rid of. That's the thing. I mean, I will say during COVID when we weren't able to sell in person, I was like, I was a fool. I was a fool to be going around the country sitting in a booth. I'm 42 years old. What am I doing at Comic-Con trying to sell prints? Mm -hmm. That's a young man's game. It should be a home like this, shipping out tubes, like a grown-up. <laughs> and then like, we just went and did our first event in Chicago, and I was like, what a moron! You can just stand here and people hand you money! It's amazing! Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, we were talking about this earlier today, but, you know, it's interesting because, like, a lot of the artists that we really looked up to when we were in college were people like Jeff McFetridge or Gary Baseman, and they were, you know, practicing what we considered at the time to be like a really omnivorous approach to art making, where it was like, oh, they'll do like a gallery show, but then they'll also make like a TV commercial. A TV commercial. A big for Pepsi. Yeah, exactly. And it was like, oh wow, like what a cool approach to like a practice. Oh, and they're then, so enlightened. They, they must make it a priority to do this and then to do that. Yeah, and you get to a certain age and you're like, oh, they're just trying to like make a living. They're just trying to live. <laughs> I'm just trying to They're live. just saying yes to everything until well, they are. Well, probably not everything, you know. Well, they're saying yes to as many things as they can until they're at a point of comfort where they can say no to the things they don't want to do. Yeah, exactly. So, like, it is important to, like, trying to not shoehorn yourself too small and, like, think about, like, different ways in which, like, your art can uh, apply to other things. Right. Uh, did we forget anything? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Boy, I put this here to be like, if we forgot something, we'll say it. But how would I remember, actually? <laughs> yeah. So I might feel pretty dumb. Uh, was there any stories you wanted to tell? No, probably not. We probably told them. Yeah. Uh, anyway, this week, we're here at Austin Paint. We're in Clarksville. And we are printing this guy. So it's like a layer of monoprint. And then there's uh, purple organs and guts. And then there's a, a split fountain skeleton that goes on the top. And there's more pictures. So today we were printing with the printmaking students. We uh, did the, the pink meat uh, layer. And we might do some more tomorrow. Surely like, they did most of it. Uh, honestly, they did most of it. What we a just, racket from us, right? I know. We just fly in and we eat your food and then we like, they're like, do this, do that, you know. We wore aprons and we didn't really do much. I got a little dirty. I washed my hands. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, anyway, so if you want to hang out in the, in the studio, uh, tomorrow, we'll be in there pretty much all day. Maybe we'll come in around 10 and we'll uh, just start printing. And we'll take, obviously, we'll take a lunch break. But then, like, uh, we'll be printing the split fountain in the afternoon, like after lunch. And we'll be printing the purple guts before. Mm -hmm. And we'll just be hanging out. If you want to bring work or if you want to talk, if you're too shy to ask a question in person, but you would ask us a question in the printmaking studio tomorrow, uh, that is what I would recommend. So, because that is where we'll be. So, I don't know. Anyway, that's it. Thanks. Take some questions? Sure. All right, so this is going to be weird because we're also doing on Zoom. Which camera are we on? Mm -hmm. All right, so can you all hear me? Wait, hold on. Now can you hear me? No? Now. Now. No. OK. Well, that worked earlier. Now it's not. Um, <laughs> We're going to, well, I'm not going to pass this around so we can hear you. So if you have a question, please speak loudly. I was, if I get this working, I'll do that so the people on Zoom can hear you. Um, and yeah, if I get this working, then you'll see me running back and forth. 
um, until that happens, go ahead and ask your questions. And with, if you're on Zoom and have a question, we'll get to those too. You, we could just repeat the question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It'll be all right. Have we have questions? Oh, nobody had a question. Nothing to repeat. Um, so if you attended the lecture in person, will you be able to access the recording of it? Then they said, well, if you attended the lecture in person, will you be able to access the recording on Zoom? And people are shaking their heads. People are shaking their heads. Yes. 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 <laughs> that worked. Uh, Jake Clue. Any other questions? That,
but like you know, you can hire the little friends of printmaking. They'll deliver on time. Yeah. Like, there, it seems there must like there's be ten like, of them. There's like yeah, ten, twenty of them when it's just like two extremely tired people. Right. <laughs> and yeah, and that was the thing of like you know, oh yeah, I didn't get to it in the talk. You know, that there's the thing that you forget to talk about. But like you know, all of the stuff like calling ourselves the little friends of printmaking and then starting to have clients. It was very, we treated it very much like a joke. Like it was like. Haha, ha, we have a logo. Isn't that funny? Haha, ha, we have a website. Before people really had websites, we're like, we have a website. That's so funny. Wouldn't it be stupid if we got business cards? Yeah, exactly. And then it's like, I'm like, haha, ha, we're doing client work. Haha, ha, we're doing taxes. Haha, ha, 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 ha. like, we have to be adults. Yeah, now it's a real thing. So that was that's our whole trajectory of like starting out as brats who wanted to like <laughs> illegally get or not illegally but like sneakily get a van to go. I didn't, didn't yeah. want to go to IKEA. Yeah. <laughs> but like I didn't need to. We just bought an oven, man. Yeah. Like, we didn't need the van. <laughs> it was not necessary. <laughs> anyway, uh, somebody else had a question. I'm sorry if we already answered it. If it was about IKEA. And, uh, <laughs> Almost never. Really? Well, I mean, I guess there's the body print, right? So we did that, but like, it's funny because the original version of the print, you know, like, we can go back. The original version of the print was really accurate, and it was really off-putting. Yeah. And so it was a thing of like, okay, well, it needs to have four fingers. And then it's like, okay, well, the legs have to be a lot shorter. <laughs> it's not cute. I mean, really, have you ever looked at how long a thigh is? It's oh my like, god, it's freakish. It's like so weird. Like, why are they that long? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, I'm sure it does. I'm, in a stem way, I'm sure it does make sense, yeah. but not, not in a visual yeah. way. So, like, you know, then it. Yeah. So, I mean, there is like that kind of thing where we do get fascinated with things like plant life or like animals and things like that. And we want to be accurate, but then there's always the dialing things back. Yeah. There's like that uncanny valley kind of situation where things can't be that accurate. I, I will say, stem-wise, we're doing two new board books mm -hmm. that are about uh, aviation for little babies. I we didn't come up with this idea. I think it's no, slightly no. crazy. I think it's good though. But like, we're gonna have like planes on the inside, and they'll show like you know the flaps and like the thing that controls the yaw, and hopefully three-year-olds will understand what we're trying to do. Well, at the very least, they're coming. Their parents will be like, oh, this is very thorough. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it's interesting because we do a lot of stuff where we play with, you know, the shape of the body or we play with like architecture and then we'll hear from Oh like, yeah, an architect. We heard from a medical illustrator. But they like this a lot. They really like this and I was just like, I don't know why. <laughs> but you know, well, we, we with the storefront ones, we always hear from architects and we're like, thank thank God for you. Well, I mean, this sounds like kissing my own butt, but people are like, thank you so much for making it not an unrealistic building. Like there's definitely this is the window and you have room where the floor would be and then the vents and pipes and then yes, you don't just like put a bunch of squares on a rectangle and call it a building. I'm like, thank you, we love architecture. We wouldn't do that to you. But I mean I would say that probably like especially chemistry plays more into it than like uh, biology. <laughs> it's really simple, it's just polyvinyl acrylic yeah. and like water. Yeah. Well That's for it. screen printing. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, Chris Hamilton. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, I have a uh, question on Zoom. So yeah. there's actually, there's two of them I'm going to combine into one. Um, but first, uh, Molly Perry. So she typed in. She's a huge fan, tuning hey, in from Molly. Tennessee Tech. And she really wants to get into spring, screen printing. What do you recommend for someone with limited space and a small budget for a very good for a good entry point into the trade and combined with another one how much would you say it typically typically cost to start screen printing those are good questions um i mean you know uh, there's one of the things that we like about printmaking is there's a million different ways to approach any mm -hmm. specific uh project there's no wrong problems. answer there's really no wrong answer what we did so i can really only talk about like what we specifically did um we slowly built our studio over the course of years, just picking up pieces of equipment on Craigslist and eBay. Or like um, from old or from printers who quit or, or died or, yes. you know, I mean, it's sad, but it's true. Yeah, um, yeah, we got a lot when one of our 
um, emeritus professor who's passed away. But, um, you know, so I would say probably what I think is the most important thing if you're starting out is to work at a shared space. Absolutely. Um, because you, I, I, I've seen so many people, you know, and it's great uh, to learn how to write like a business loan or like, you know, a grant proposal or something like that. But I just feel like sometimes you end up with equipment that you think you needed. But you didn't. But you didn't. So you don't know what you want to do yet. Yeah, so I think it's really important. And we did this for years, you know, after we graduated, we actually took like a credit with the university for a couple semesters just to be able to work still in that shared space. Right. And then, you know, we ran a print and publishing lab, which was a shared space, and it really gives you the opportunity to be like, what kind of exposure unit do I need? How I know, many I know I need one, need? but like what kind, how big? Yeah, like, exactly. How much is too much? So I would caution against jumping in with both feet and just sort of like work with somebody else, figure out what you need, and then, you know, slowly you pick up equipment that way. But I mean Maybe the two question ask askers need to get go in on this stuff together. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, they I need mean, to meet each other. I, I would we say we worked on our kitchen table for a oh, really yeah. long time. Like yeah. we just had a board with clamps that we would throw in a closet. Um, we washed out screens in, in, our, in, the tub. in our tub, so that uh, security closet was gone. Um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, we, or sometimes, you know, uh, we would ask local t-shirt uh, companies, is it okay if we uh, expose our screens here? You just give them pizza or beer and like the... Or, yeah, money, that was, Milwaukee. Money. That was Milwaukee, so beer was, was currency, but like, the, you know, they probably want money now, but like, um, so... I would say that those are the best ways to do it. So it's hard to quantify exactly how much money you need. Well, I would say the most important things that you have to get are a good screen and a good squeegee. The ink, I don't know, you can cheap out on the ink, it's fine. The exposure is extremely important. Yeah, if you have a bad exposure, you will never get a good print. You can have, you can work around even a dented squeegee. Right. You can work around like a hole in a screen, but if you have a bad exposure, you will literally never be able to have a good print. So it might be a thing of like she was talking about not finding someone who has an exposure unit and paying them to use it. And it may be looking at YouTube and trying to figure out one of those deals where people have a closet with a halogen mold and then they try not to burn their house down. <laughs> uh, but that that's the kind of thing I I would you know ask around and see if people can help you out first before I spent a lot of money. Well, and that's the thing too, is it's like... Before I spent more than, let's say, $200. Yeah, I mean, I don't advise buying a kit. That's no, just, like, I never buy a kit. Not a good idea, because you do end up with a lot of like shoddy equipment that you you're not going to need. Because um, kits are made for somebody, but is that person you? I don't know. Probably yeah. not. <laughs> but, it, you know, it's, it's just important to, I think, you know, people want to do everything like they want to be in their own house working and obviously that you know screen printing can be a solitary pursuit we have definitely made it so but like there's a nice sense of community involved in working in a shared space mm -hmm. and you want to know the other people that are pr printing in your area yeah it's just really nice to be they, able they to probably have, have old equipment that they don't want that you can have too yeah. that's the other thing yeah. don't don't buy things first meet people and ask what's up yeah exactly Anybody we good I, mean, I have another one for Zoom, but I want to give y'all a chance. Anyone? These Zoom people are showing yeah, the guys. They're making you look like a fool. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a great question. Uh, this is from Emma Schwartz. Uh, how do you guys work out conflict in your artistic ideas? That was a bigger problem when we were more your age. Uh, when we were your age. Well, you can't assume. <laughs> when we were college age, yeah. when we were starting out, uh, if we got a big job, it was a fight because you'd think, oh, this is the first big band that we're doing a poster for. This is the first magazine cover ever that we're doing. I have to get my way. Yeah. And then it's like, and then we're fighting, and it's ugly, and... We have, yeah, we, like, we did a poster for Wilco, and it was just like... He had his poster and I had my poster and it was like, how do we like marry the two posters? And that's just not possible. And now we're fighting. And it was just one of those things where, you know, because you're so young, you feel like this is like the, the first, and, first only and only time I'm ever going to be able to do anything like this. And that's simply just not true. Life you know? is long. Life is very long and you will get your way, you know, eventually. Uh, so yeah. 
it was it was fine because yeah, I mean like we just basically were like, oh, this is a, you know not a sprint, this is a marathon. Like we were doing this for a long period of time, and like sometimes I get to do it, and sometimes like he gets to do it. And truly, sometimes it's extremely democratic where we both submit sketches to the client, right? And well, you know, the client chooses, and we don't. It's not up to us. You the know? longer you go, the more it is like. It's just not important. Am I, is Melissa too busy to do the sketch? Then I'll do it. Yeah. Like, who cares? Like, truly. Then, like, what are you supposed to do? Be like, well, I would have done it differently. Well, then you should have done it. Yeah, and we don't really have, like, that sense of, um, like, people ask us sometimes, like, what what outlet do you have? Like, when do you make your own art? And, like, to me, that's not. It's not important. Maybe it just goes back to my sense of, like, democracy of print and the collective of everything. But it's like, I don't feel like my voice is not being heard through all of the work that we make. You know what I mean? Like I think what people maybe don't understand. Well, this is I'm talking about our experience, and I'm not giving advice anymore. But like, <laughs> you know, over the period of 20 years, we've just sort of built a house style. Like there was probably a point when we were younger where you could see this is a Melissa poster, and this is a James poster, and this is one that they both worked on, and maybe Melissa got way more or something like that, and you could quantify it. And at this point. You couldn't tell me. I don't know which ones I worked on. I don't know which ones she worked on. Yeah. Like, we've been working together so long that, like, you know, it's just like, oh, well, we work in this style, which is just our style. Uh, but anyway, it's just something. Unfortunately, you're just gonna have to go through this, and then you're gonna have to wake up one day and think about that you fought with your collaborator over getting your way, and look at it and be like, it was not important. Both versions were pretty good. Yeah. And then you're going to feel really sorry for yourself. <laughs> and hopefully you will have the grace to apologize. But I feel like this is pointed. <laughs> it is not. I'm talking about myself. <laughs> I didn't talk about myself. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, it's, conflict is natural. But like eventually you're just going to realize that like if you're working with somebody and you intend to do it for a long time, that it, it really, you just have to get over it. Yeah, and truly, I mean, like, I guess if, if it is. A problem, you can make your own work. Yes, that's you know, you true. You don't have to. You can have collaborative work, and you can also have your own work. Yeah. So. Um, an, another one from Zoom, uh, from from Maribel Diaz. Uh, huge fan, so thank you. Um, thank you for coming tonight, and thank you for everything. Uh, for someone that's interested in freelancing or licensing, I was wondering, do you have an art lawyer? And if not, how do you protect yourself with copyright with your art? or when something goes wrong in a contract? We do have an art lawyer. Um, we also have a rep. Yeah. Um, we have had to... Uh, had to have legal proceedings. Yeah, before. I didn't know what the word was for. I don't know. I <laughs> thought you were very delicate about it, but the reality is, well, who cares? Like, somebody submitted one of our designs to be... You don't have to be well, I'm not being I'm, well, that's why I paused, because I'm trying not to be specific. The wild thing is it was for a, a major design conference. Mm -hmm. And so, like, but it was our work. And we didn't go to the design conference. We skipped it. And, but then our work was there, and people were like, oh, I thought you were here. Yeah. And so we, at first, we didn't hear anything about it, because the, the boldness of it was like, oh, they must have gotten a little friends to do that. That's nice. And then, like, people were like, oh, that that's somebody else. Somebody just handed in your work. And they're like, this is the poster for the design conference. And it's just like, ooh, now we have to get the lawyer. Yeah. And it was very ugly. And ultimately, you don't get as much money as you think. Well, you know, I think one of the things that's really disappointing, and I guess it's just like sort of the way things are now, is you, you know, we're very Midwestern at heart. That's where we grew up. And we try to be gracious and understanding in all situations, um, that is not a time to be gracious or understanding right. when you're being exploited by a large company. Um, so one of the unfortunate situations was, you know, people were making a big stink about it online, and we were like, it's okay, guys. We have lawyers involved. It's fine. Let it die down. Well, the problem was that the company that did was in the wrong was like, you know, this doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal anymore. So how much do we really owe you? So let people let make people make a stink about it. Let people get mad because otherwise corporations will exploit you as much as they possibly can. Um, but yes, we have a lawyer. We have a rep that helps us with uh, contracts. But even before we, you know, having a rep is like 
relatively new in our long career. Yeah, like, maybe maybe the last ten years. Yeah, maybe, we, maybe even shorter than that. Yeah, I think we got it right before we moved to California. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, it was just one of those things where we handled contracts ourselves, and that was self-taught. It was difficult. But you know, there are books and uh, the graphics are the graphic art skilled guidebook is nice for that. Yeah, but unfortunately, sometimes you will be exploited. Sometimes you'll be exploited by uh, companies that are out of reach. Either they're overseas, or you know, they just don't care. Um, and that just is kind of that's just part of it, unfortunately. Yeah. it's a it's a really bleak part of the illustration. Yeah. If we but ended the talk right now, that'd be sad. <laughs> It's, it's just important not to focus on it, because frankly, it's such a, even though it happened to us, it's such a small part of our entire story or our life, like, getting stolen from this should not define you, like, mm -hmm. just make more art. Yeah. Good. Oh, one more? Okay. <laughs> oh, this is from, uh, from Molly Perry. Um, so how do you decide on what to charge for your work? Do you, uh, do you do an hourly plus cost of materials, or do you decide on a flat rate at the beginning? Uh, usually we just do a detailed quote. It depends on what kind of work. Yeah. I mean, honestly, with things like, I don't know, magazine covers or, or record packaging or something, they usually come to you with a fee. Then we get out the graphic arts guidebook, or graphic arts guild guidebook, and we see if that's normal. Or we ask a friend, like, hey, you just did a record package. What did you get paid? And, mm -hmm. and then we're like, oh, Again, yeah. Again, sense of community is very important. Yeah. Right. And then we're like, okay, that seems normal. And then so we just say yes or no, depending on that. Uh, so people will approach you with like a number in mind. Uh, in terms of silkscreen, we do uh, a set price, mm -hmm. like per piece. And per color. Well, I don't do that anymore. Oh, do you know? No, I just do 660 per. Okay. And then like with a minimum of 50, because I don't want to do, make 10 prints for you. And then like a, a design fee, depending on the complexity of the design, probably between five and fifteen hundred dollars. And like that's not very much. But then you add up the printing mm -hmm. with the design fee, and then it's a fine payday. Yeah, but you know, a lot of I, I just wish that clients would approach you and just tell you what their budget was. It's just so much back and forth, and we were dancing around it. But you know, um, it really depends on the project. I think that that's. The nice thing and also the difficult thing about being sort of like a little boutique design and yeah. illustration agency is it's like every single quote is individual so yeah it's funny because like we were just in chicago and a guy who ran a marketing company approached me about doing a job and i think that he thought that he was going to like sucker somebody into getting like very cheap prints made for him and i was like oh well we have a minimum of 50 and it's 660 per and then there's a design fee of blah, 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 depending on the complexity. And he did the math in his head, and he's like, well, that's all very reasonable. And I'm like, well, I try to be very reasonable. Yeah, and we'll probably never hear from him. We'll probably never hear from him again, because like, I think he was looking for a deal. But like, I mean, your work, our work, your work, it's worth something. Like, yeah. Make sure that you get paid. Now, of course, the graphic arts guild handbook is. Uh, the numbers are a little high. The numbers are bonkers sometimes, but it's, it's a nice sort of roundabout idea of like how to pr uh, price your work. What I like to think with the Graphic Arts Guild Guide is, this is what Jessica Hish gets paid. <laughs> this is what Paula Shear gets paid. Yeah. And then so we just aim a little lower than that. Sure. And then like when you buy the book, maybe just aim a little lower than what we're getting and then you're straight. Everything's going to be cool. Yeah. But you know, we usually, it is usually a flat fee. Sometimes we've definitely like uh, screwed ourselves a little bit by getting a flat fee. Um, but oh we, God, we yes. try to build in like, okay, it's a flat fee and you get, you know, we're going to do X amount of sketches. And then on that sketch that's chosen, you have X amount of revisions. And if you go above those revisions, it's X amount of dollars. Right. And, you know, if the job runs past the deadline, it's like, you have to pay us the, you know what I mean? So it's like we have all these stop gaps in place for ourselves to kind of protect ourselves a little bit. So. Right. We have gotten very lazy because we have a rep. Because what a rep is really good for it is not so much for reading contracts or accepting payment or sending an invoice. Frankly, he's terrible at sending invoices, to be honest. <laughs> but like, it's having someone who will get on the phone and yell at someone who is not respecting your time and treating you badly. So like, if we have a client that is a problem, we can tell our rep, go yell at this person. They are being bad. And then we'll do it. And then we still get to be like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I guess he's mad at you. I don't know. Yeah, you like, just tell me how help is going. Well, he's really mad at you. He's really mad at you. But we're nice, so. <laughs>
we have time for one more question? Do you have a question? Can you hear me? Uh-huh. Um, so do you go out and see data clients when they come to you? And how has that changed your career? That's a really good question. So when I started... Oh, you should repeat the question. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'll repeat the question. So basically it was like, do clients approach you or do you approach clients and how did that change throughout your career? Um, when we started, I was working full time. I mean, this was still in college. Uh, I was working, you know, full time going to school and then staying up late and just like, who did I think was cool? Who did I want to work for? Yep. Just like basically not cold calling because I wasn't calling them. It was three in the morning. That would be insanity. Um, but like just emailing everybody like, hey, and like I'm again Midwestern, like I'm not like a. a show What's the opposite of a wallflower? Yeah. A floor. Yeah, I am a wallflower. Queen. You know what I mean? Like so, it it just it makes me uncomfortable to sort of like self-aggrandize. Yeah. But that's what you have to do, right? Because like everybody's gonna do it. So I would just email anybody that I thought was cool and be like, Hey, you're cool. I'm cool. Let's work together. Yeah. And if they emailed me back, cool. Then I got a job and I got a new client. Um, so I, would I mean, maybe, that. maybe one out of a hundred. I mean, well, actually, no, that's not true. Maybe ten out of a hundred would be emailed back and be like, "Hey, we think what you're doing is neat too. Bye." And then, like, one out of a hundred would be like, "Yeah, yeah, let's do something. I'm thinking this." Yeah. But like, you know, you'd have to send out the hundred emails to a hundred people that you think are cool before somebody's like, "Yeah, I think I can do something with you." Yeah, and I think it's really easy, you know, because you do sort of start rolling, like you have your client base and like other people see it and like they start contacting you and you get kind of comfortable and you don't do that anymore and then you have to remind yourself like, oh yeah, again, it's like that self-initiation thing where it's like, if I want to be doing something, I need to go and tell somebody. Yes. I can't wait around and be like, oh, I wish somebody would ask we're, me to do... We're absolutely spoiled. We did yeah. this this year, where we made the first children's book, and it, things seemed to go really well. And we're like, well, certainly someone will contact us and ask us to write another children's book. And it's like, why would they do why that? Why would they do that? Why would they do that? Like, you have to go out and pitch your own book if you want to write it. Well, but see, then that's the thing is, at the point where I was, we were walking the dog, and I was like, you know what? I've been such a brat. I've been like, why isn't anyone contacting us? What I have to do is I have to contact the person at writer's house and be like, let's get together like a pressies, we'll put together proposals and we'll get serious about this. And then the next day we got a job to do two more children's books. Yes, they asked us. We didn't have to do anything. Yes. <laughs> but you know, so like we're just lazy and we're babies and we're absolutely no. spoiled. <laughs> no. And you should not listen to anything you say. No. Um, but yeah, I mean that's the thing. So it's like, you know, you will have those sort of like periods in your career where it's just sort of rolling and you don't have to do anything. But then every so often, or if you want to change, or if you want to change direction, yeah. Like that's yeah. the thing about the books is like we're not in part of that world. Mm -hmm. Like it was a fluke that somebody was just like, hey, you'd be really good at doing a book about art studios, and they were right. But like that was just that's like getting hit by lightning. Like. No one's going to contact artists and be like, I want you to do a book about this. It's funny that you say that because actually how that job came about is I saw on Twitter that an old Flickr friend of mine was now an art director and he was looking for illustrators and I said to him, hey, if you're looking for illustrators, we're available. And then he was like, oh, hey, we actually have this book that's about art studios, you'd, you'd be great. You know, so you kind of always have to just keep your ear to the ground and like, and yeah, and make friends and stay in touch. Mm -hmm. I think that's a that's a thing we have to do. Yeah. They were good. All right. All right. I want to thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for everyone that's coming out. Thank you for everyone that logged in through Zoom. Um, I appreciate it. If you do have one of those little tickets, you want to come get your limited edition letter press poster. Uh, come see me. Um, have a great night. Stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.